So we are going to chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. So it's a combination of Bible study and theological study or theology study. And uh, most of you heard the sermon, right? So you see that uh, what this, the, the Lord is teaching us, and I use this word transformed, transformation. And uh, so uh, Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So basically... The key word here is transformation. So you are transformed by the renewal of your mind. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> which means you think differently. You think completely differently about things, right? So at the beginning of Romans, he says, well, they didn't want to have God in their mind. You know, and then God allowed them to do all kinds of evil things, sexual towards their parents, you know. God just loved them. And, and it's interesting, they didn't want to have God in their minds, so it's chapter 1. And in chapter 12, he says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So how, how do you renew your mind? So, you know, he's been talking to us. You killed your old Adam, crucify, be led by the Spirit, new thinking, new thinking, be transformed. But it's interesting that he's not talking just about your mind, I mean, when you transform your mind, you will be able to discern what is the will of God. So you will understand what pleases God. And again, it's coming from the Spirit, right? This renewal. And, and, and you see the contrast. Before that in your trespasses, before following the course of this world, before being under the influence of Satan, now alive in Christ. Now the Holy Spirit lives in you. So this is when this renewal happens, right? So unless we resist the Holy Spirit, right? So, or we somehow uh, stop following Christ, stop clinging to Christ, right? So this is where we can uh, get stuck. So renew, and then you will know what the will of God is, right? So you will know. You will be able to discern, right? What is the will of God? And, uh, and, but also the first part is present your bodies as living sacrifices. So whatever happens in your mind affects your bodies as well, right? So then your bodies are living sacrifice. And, and he talks about this a lot, that uh, do not be enslaved to all kinds of sinful desires and present the members of your body uh, as slaves to righteousness. Uh, so which means it's not just our mind, I believe in Jesus, but it also manifests itself. It's about manifestation. How your body manifests the presence of the Spirit in you. Uh, all kind of ways. So, but do you see, uh, uh, this is your spiritual worship. This is your spiritual, this is how you worship the Lord. It's not just bringing nice flowers, which is also good to bring nice flowers, but your worship when you present your bodies, you present your minds, you're willing to be transformed, right? This is our worship, holy worship. And it can happen anywhere, so not just in this building, just anywhere. And because the, this section is about sanctification and transformation, I decided to enlighten and educate you a little bit with Lutheran theology. And this is what we use in our seminary. This is the main uh, uh, textbook on dogmatics, Christian dogmatics, Christian theology by Pieper. Uh, and I copied three pages uh, that talk about uh, sanctification. So, and I want us just to read it. And uh, if we can read it slowly, and you can imagine yourself, you're in a seminary and study theology, Lutheran theology a little bit. Just skip all the uh, Latin terminology, because theologians like mm, doctors use Latin, uh, Latin terminology. It's good that IT doesn't use Latin terminology, right? 
<laughs> or other areas. <laughs> Once and zeros. <laughs> Once and zeros, math. Okay, so who effects sanctification? Uh, God, who creates faith, also produces sanctification. Uh, have you found it? It's section four. Uh huh. Also produces sanctification by his infinite power. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Faithful is he that calls you who will also do it. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But in this work of sanctification, the Christian also plays a part. Okay, in justification, you don't play a part. Justification is wholly done by Jesus. But in sanctification, we play a part. We play a part. In conversion, man merely experiences the working of God. But in sanctification, the Christian plays an active role. He cooperates in sanctification. So, which means everybody who comes to every church in this country and all over the world is supposed to cooperate with God. How do we cooperate? So we think, okay, Bible study. Why do you need Bible study? Okay, we need to know the will of God. We want to cooperate. Why do we need Christian fellowship? Well, because that's part of sanctification. Now, we can be and do all kinds of things and still remember about God. Okay, yeah, God, you died for me. So, but then God instituted certain, certain ways how he does that sanctification, right? And you need other Christians. You need church, you need fellowship, you need communion. You need all that stuff. You need to hear the sermon. So I don't know where people got this idea that can be, they can be uh, voluntarily refuse to be here and part of this, you know, fellowship, regular fellowship, and at the same time, cooperate. So I think it's individualism in general in the West. I can be, I'm self-sufficient. Right, so I don't need anybody, so I have my private space, I'm self-sufficient, right? So it may be stemming from there. Or, okay, in any event, copyright. However, and let this be clearly understood, the working of God and the working of the new man, and the new man, it's, the new man is the opposite of the old Adam. The new man, this is what is born in us from above, right? The new, new man. And the working of the new man are not coordinate as when two horses draw a wagon. But the activity of the new man is always and fully subordinated to God's activity. Yeah, we cooperate, but we are subordinated to God always. God is above us, we under him. It always takes place uh, depending on God. Right? Dependenter adeo, it's depending on God. You depend on God. You are not independent, you are dependent. In other words, it is the Holy Ghost who produces the activity of the new man. The new man remains the organ of the Holy, Holy Ghost. The new man remains the organ of the Holy Ghost. Right? And th that is why the new man will be fighting with the old Adam. You will see that fight all the time. All these points are set forth in the formula of Concord. From this, then, it follows that as soon as the Holy Ghost, through the Word and Holy Sacraments, has begun in us his work of regeneration and renewal, it is certain that through the power of the Holy Ghost we can and should cooperate, although still in great weakness. But this, that we cooperate, does not occur from our carnal, natural powers, but from the new powers <coughs> and gifts which the Holy Ghost has begun in us in conversion. So, all these new powers are coming from God himself. And when I say, when very often people say, I have to teach myself to be patient, right? I have to teach myself to be joyous. So this is when we are trying to do that from our carnal powers, from our, you know, uh, from ourselves. But what we need to seek is to let these powers to come from Holy Ghost, right? Uh, 
St. Paul expressly and earnestly exhorts that as workers together with him, we receive not the grace of God in vain. So we receive the grace. So it's grace of God that is working in us. But this is to be understood in no other way than the converted, than the converted man does good to such an extent as so long as God, by his Holy Spirit, rules, guides, and leads him. And that as soon as God would withdraw his gracious hand from him, he could not for a moment persevere in obedience to God. But if this were understood thus, that the converted man cooperates with the Holy Ghost in the manner as when two horses draw a wagon, this could in no way be considered without prejudice to the divine truth. So uh, we are dependent on God. We cooperate. And when he says we cooperate, he means that we can resist. We can cooperate, but we can also resist. We can say no. Well, will, will you come to worship with us? No. Will you come to partake in the Lord's Supper? No. Will you have fellowship with us? No. Why? Well, because I want to do something else. Or I have other plans. So we can cooperate, but we can also resist. Uh, to the question as who takes the initiative in generating the individual spiritual impulses or individual good works, the new man or the Holy Ghost, Scripture answers that the first suggestion and impulse to every good work proceeds from the Holy Ghost. Scripture traces even every good thought to God as his author. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So sanctification is coming from the Holy Spirit. So He does that, but we need to cooperate. Any questions on this section? I mean, it's straightforward, right? So now, uh, the next uh, portion is very interesting. The inner motions of sanctification how that actually happens inside of us, these motions, how it happens. Well, by faith in Christ, a new man has been born, whose will agrees perfectly with the will of God. So Romans 7, 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. According to the new man, a Christian is therefore perfectly holy, dead unto sin, but alive unto God. But in this life, the Christian retains his sinful nature. The old man, our outward man, right? And you see all the references. The body of sin, or my flesh, who is under the rule of sin. Okay, so... Uh, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So, okay, you see that in this life, the Christian retains his sinful nature, the old man, who is under the rule of sin, and who strives against the new man. The old man will be fighting against the new man uh, in this life. And the new man will be fighting against the old man. Uh, sanctification, therefore, is brought about only in this way that in the struggle going on within a Christian between his new nature and his old nature, a Christian, according to his new man, prevails over the will and conduct, uh, conduct of the old man. So you... You're supposed to prevail, and this is sanctification. According to Scripture, sanctification expressed neg negatively consists in the putting off of the old Adam and positively in the putting on of the new man. Put off the old man, put on the new man. The old Ad man is the old Adam, right? Sinful nature. Regarding the conflict of the spirit with the flesh, we note first, and then uh, there are several notes. So, regarding the conflict of the spirit with the flesh, we note, this constant struggle 
doesn't prove that a Christian has fallen from grace. So if you feel that struggle, it doesn't mean that you are lost, as he may perhaps think in the hour of trial. But on the contrary, such conflict is evidence that he is living in the state of grace. Only when the struggle has ceased, he has fallen from grace. Um, only when the struggle has ceased has the fall from grace taken place. So which means if you feel no problem, you are lost. <laughs> if you feel that you are struggling and fighting with the old Adam in any capacity, it can be like any area or aspect, that means you are alive. And even if you have that, so when you feel that struggle, don't think that you, lo you are lost. On the contrary, when you don't feel anything, you are lost. You're just like, everything is fine. I'm fine. No problem. I don't need anything. Everything is good. You know, I just went to this cherry orchard and it really was nice. You know, I just enjoy life, right? So I don't think about my inner struggles. I just enjoy this, like, you know, new place where they make those wonderful donuts, you know. And, you know, <laughs> I just, you know, I just enjoy life. Right? You know, so, and then there is no inner struggle, no problem. So this is when you are lost. And this is when it's a sign of danger. So because if you are going through the process of sanctification, you will feel that struggle. So next, note two. Since the old uh, man of a Christian retains his old evil nature, just as it uh, exists in unbelievers, Christians man, must not be surprised, on the one hand, with inclinations to rankest unbelief stir in their heart or temptations to commit the uh, coarse, cor, coarsest, coarsest. coarsest sins. So some Christians think, okay, I could have done, I mean, away with all those sins by this time, right? But sometimes uh, all kind of evil things. So you think, how am I different from non-believer? Well, we are very, we are very much like non-believers because we have the same old Adam, sinful nature. The only difference is that now we are, we know Jesus and we have discovered this way out and, you know, we can ask the Lord to help us. So, but uh, we should not be surprised. Because many people say, oh, he's a Christian, she's a Christian, how? How could she? How could he? Well, very simple. Because they have this sinful nature. You just relax a little bit and it just pops, pops up. <laughs> so do you, do you know that game where you have to hit frogs on the head or what? Is it? <laughs> so there is this game and it pops up and yeah, you can... Moles. You have to hit the moles. Yeah, the yeah, moles, yes, <laughs> moles. <laughs> you just relax a little bit and it... Uh... On the other hand, they must bear in mind that the spirit's struggle against the flesh does not aim at improving and reforming. But at crucifying and mortifying the flesh. This is very pr profound. You are not supposed to improve your old Adam or reform your old Adam. So we are now on page 16. Page 16, right? Did you find it? So uh, does not aim at improving and reforming, but at crucifying and mortifying the flesh. It's on the back of the one that says six, mm -hmm. uh, Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Mortifying and uh, crucifying and mortifying the flesh. Did you define it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh, okay. So this is profound. You, you don't just reform. You don't just improve. You are supposed to crucify and mortify this old Adam. Such a treatment of the flesh is demanded by Scripture. Roman 8.13, uh, mortify the deeds of the body. Galatians 5.24, the, the, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affliction and lust. Colossians 3.5, mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, etc. 1 Corinthians 9.27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjections. 
subjection. Matthew 18, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It means uh, tempts you, right? Uh, okay, so it, it's not just, hey, let us improve our old Adam. Just crucify and mortify it. And I think that today's psychologists would try to improve the old Adam. Right? There is no repentance, there is no mortification of the, of the old nature, it's just, hey, let us work out a way, seven steps, you know, uh, so many sessions, we'll teach you these techniques, you know, it's just working with the old Adam. This, this is a fundamental flaw in our current culture, that people are inherently good. Yeah. If we just eliminate the bad or not teach them the bad, mm -hmm. they'll automatically be good. That's right. Yeah, it's totally opposite of yeah. this. The, 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 that's right. That's right. And this is in churches as well. Well, because people who go to churches live in this <coughs> culture. No, no surprise that in the churches you can uh, hear the same thing. And then number three. The struggle of the spirit against the flesh is difficult and painful. Mortify, crucify, cut them off, and the flesh, which must be given that treatment, is not being separate from us, but is part and parcel of ourselves. But we find comfort in the thought that, as Luther often reminds us, the great saints experience the same bitter struggle. We hear the great Apostle Paul crying out in anguish, O wretched man that I am. It's not easy. It's not easy. Number four. Victory in this battle is assured to him who continues in the grace of God and God's word and thus gives the Holy Spirit opportunity uh, to work in him effectually with his divine power. That is very interesting. Victory in this battle is assured to him who continues. And I think that the key word here is who continues. In the grace of God and God's word, and thus gives the Holy Spirit opportunity to work in him effectually with his divine power. So that is why we need to know the scriptures. So this is just like, essential process of this. Um, this he does when we realize our weakness. So when we realize our weakness, this is when the Holy Spirit can work in us effectively. So th that is why you can hear me. Um, sometimes I, 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 when I preach, I, I say, okay, we understand that we're sinful. How can we overcome that? We need to recognize it. We need to acknowledge. We need to say, Lord, help me. I am weak. Help me. Okay? So when we recognize, when we, re we realize our weakness, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when I'm weak, then I am strong. So Luke 18, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And this is divine power is exerted through the word. Uh, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So you need the word of God. You need the scriptures. Uh, so it's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And then John chapter 15, verse 7. Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And what will happen if we thus employ the word of God? Romans 8, 37. In all these things we are more than conquerors. And uh, the Greek word is hypernikomen. Hypernikomen. We keep achieving the most brilliant victory. You want to achieve the most brilliant victory? Abide in the word of God. Paul describes the victorious outcome in detail. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul's play upon words cannot be reproduced in the translation. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. 
persecuted but not forsaken, cast out but not destroyed, always bearing, uh, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So, regarding the use of God's word in the conflict of the spirit with the flesh, Luther says, you must be sober and vigilant in order that the body may become fit. Luther often speaks of the proper training of the body in this connection, but he does not overestimate this uh, external pedagogy, you know, this external training. So he would say it's okay to fast. So this is external training. Just, or uh, uh, pray, or abstain from something, you know. Just train your body. So he was in favor of this as well. But he wouldn't overestimate it. He would say, this is not what actually helps you. What helps you is the word of God. And look what he says. Um, but thereby the devil is not yet vanquished, more than the outward training of the body against sin is needed. The real sword is this, says Luther, that you are strong and firm in the faith. If with your heart you take hold of the word of God and cling to it in faith, the devil cannot win, but must flee. If you can say, this my God has said, on this I take my stand, you will see that here slinks away, and with him will depart the sluggishness, the evil desires, anger, miserliness, melancholy, and doubt. But the devil is sly. He will not have you put your trust in the word and reaches out to wrest it out of your hand if he can make you lazy so that your body becomes unfit and filled with navish desires, he will soon wrest the sword out of your hand. He thus had his way with Eve. She had God's word, and if she had clung to it, she would not have fallen. But when the devil saw that she held the word so loosely, he tore it out of her heart, so that she let go of it, and thus he had won. Thus St. Peter has sufficiently instructed us how we are to fight the devil. Running to and from will not do, nor any work that you might perform. What is needed is that you cling to the word by faith. When he comes and would drive you into despondency because of your sin, just take hold of the word of God, which promises forgiveness of sins, and take that to, the, to heart. Then he will soon have to leave off. Well, have the word of God in you, right? So then the devil won't be able to win over you. And then the final note, number five. An important rule is that in this warfare is to do at once the very opposite of what the flesh and the devil propose. When we are tempted, you, say, you do the opposite. Your flesh, your old Adam proposes something, and you do the opposite. And he gives us an example. When we are tempted to murmur against God, then the best answer is to praise God for his many mercies. When we are tempted to entertain our own or other man's thought about matters of doctrine and life, we should simply ask, what has God revealed on this matter in Scripture? It is important for the Christian not only to read God's Word daily, but to commit to his memory as many Scripture texts as possible, so that he will be ready to repel the attacks of the flesh, the world, and the devil with the Word of Scripture, whenever and wherever they occur. Christ taught us by his example that in this way the victory is obtained. It's three volumes, and you can see that some volumes are used more often, and some are less often, and this is volume number three, and it's not used very often, you know. You're right, <coughs> and I'm like, okay, all other, I mean, we have it, we have it in our theology, why don't we talk about this? I just wanted to show you that we have it. That is why it's good to be in the scriptures. We started with Romans 12, verse 1, so that we can be renewed and we can discern what is the will of God, actually. Know the truth. In other words, know the truth, right? So let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for this time together. 
and uh, we want to be renewed. Uh, please, may Holy Spirit renew us and lead us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.